So we thought we'd give you a little momentum kind of booster, right, for your New Year's resolutions day. Yeah, we're three weeks in, but this is also about the time that those ideas that we kind of have that we want to do better in the new year kind of begins to wane a little bit. We get a little bit kind of tired, et cetera, and, and we kind of let, it, let things go. So I want to encourage you this year to, to recognize one thing that I think was really clear there, and, and that's it. Whatever we try to do differently, we cannot do in our own power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that has to drive that, right? We have to yield ourselves to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit to do his thing in us. Because in reality, one of the things that's kind of clear to me is all the times I've kind of tried willpower in my life, it hadn't worked really well, you know? But when I try God's power, it seems to do a good bit better, right? So I want to encourage you this year as you think about those things, things that might be different for you this year, to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that we you know, might be making or you might have thought you might do differently this year is the topic of what we're talking about today, something that uh, perhaps you uh, as an individual have found yourself wanting or lacking in. And uh, so today we're going to talk about the power of the tongue and, and our words, right, uh, our communication. Uh, you know, the, the, the tongue is, is very, very powerful. Would you agree? Our words, words are very, very powerful. And, and those words uh, can do lots of different things. And uh, are y'all out there in the dark on purpose or, or what is it? Yeah, okay, good. I, I, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, that's good. That's better. Okay, good. So, so here's the deal. So, so yesterday I, I, was, I was driving home from a client engagement in Charlotte. And uh, so, you know, the, my, my daughter's birthday and they were out doing, you know, the girl thing. All the girls in my family were, were out, you know, getting their nails done and all that stuff. I think my brother Lou was with them too, getting his done. But anyway, um, no, I'm just picking on <laughs> But anyway, it's two weeks in a row, Lou. You got a lot to get back for me, buddy. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so, 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 so they were doing that. So I had to stop and get some lunch. And I stopped at Chick-fil-A in Charlotte. It's a madhouse. You know, everybody was kind of getting in from the cabin fever and everything. Everybody was shopping. So I had to wait in line got my food finally, you know, or I didn't get my food, got my order placed, and, and I was over at the little, the area there, the kiosk, where you kind of have the ketchup and everything, so what I like to do, because I'm driving, is I, you know, is to get these little, you know, they have their little fruit cups or whatever, and you ask for a thing, a fruit cup, you know, and you kind of squirt all their ketchup, squirt ketchup in it, put it in your cup holder, and it makes it easy, not too messy, right, to do ketchup while you're driving, so, so, uh, so my order was placed, and I was over there doing the squeezing at the kiosk, and there was a lady that kind of came in, you know, kind of beside me. She was trying to get some, kind of moved over a little bit. She didn't say anything. And I kept on squeezing and everything. And then I heard a voice behind me a couple of, you know, a few seconds later. It says, you are absolutely fine. And I said, whoa. <laughs> I stuck this little pose. And then I turned around and looked who it was. It was the lady who had just been there and walked away, letting me know that I wasn't in her way anymore, right? But for a moment, for a moment... I thought I was getting a little compliment, right? <laughs> maybe I was. She just kind of soft shoot it maybe when I turned around. I'm not sure. But I did tell that one in my, with my wife here in the early service today. So she knows all about that. So everything's good. But, you know, our words are very, very important, right? There's a story of a couple who grew together uh, over many, many years, right? And uh, they had, you know, they shared everything. They loved together. They just really seemed to really hit it off well. And um, after about 60 years of marriage, uh, the lady went to the doctor and, you know, found she had a condition that was probably not going to change, and it was probably not, uh, not healable for her. Uh, and, and they had kept no secrets from each other in the course of their marriage. But there was, in the top of her closet, a shoebox, right? Now, she had told her husband, don't ever go near the shoebox, right? Don't touch it. Don't do anything. It's just kind of my space, right? So he didn't. After a while, he just forgot about it, right? And so they were talking one day, uh, and, uh, you know, she was on the, on the bed there in the room, and, and she said, uh, honey, I think it's time now for you to go get the shoebox, okay? Uh, I want you to see the shoebox. I want you to open it and look inside it and all that good stuff. So he didn't, he re remembered, oh gosh, the shoebox, yeah. And so, uh, and so he went, he goes to get it. He opens it up, and he finds inside the shoebox two crochet dolls and a bundle of bills totaling $95,000, okay? Two crochet dolls. And so he goes over to the bedside and I said, honey, what is this? There's two dolls in here, and then I think it's like $95,000. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to tell you about that. You see, uh, when, when we were married, uh, my grandmother told me that the secret to a happy marriage was to use nice words all the time. And she told me that if you ever said anything ugly to me, 
and I got angry with you, that I should just keep quiet and crochet a doll, all right? So the old man was pretty moved, right? He's looking, in the, he's seeing only two dolls. He said, oh, what a happy marriage we've had. He started tearing up and just all that, you know, there's just two, just two times that I've said anything negative to her. And, and so as he, through his tears, he said, honey, that's wonderful. It's beautiful. I understand the dolls, but where did the $95,000 come from? She said, well, that's the money I made by selling the dolls that I crocheted over the years, right? So, so the power of words, right, can make or break an individual or relationship of any type. And so I, I want us to talk about this in terms of what James was seeing in the New Testament. James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he's one of the church leaders in the new church. And he kind of has a bit of an edge when he writes the book of James, particularly chapter 3. And we're going to see that because that's where we're going to go today for this text about the tongue and the use of the tongue. Now, uh, in, in, in talking about this, um, he, he, he obviously there's something that has happened. I shouldn't say obviously, but I think to me, I believe there was something, some type of division, something that happened in the church involving someone using their tongue in the wrong way that had really screwed things up. Because as we look at the kind of the attitude that James has as he writes these words, uh, we kind of we kind of catch that. We kind of get that. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've been in this series called An All-Out Life, Living an All-Out Life. And we've talked about the need for us, as we're, this is going to be a theme for us all through the year, to live our lives, right, with first of all, a sense of urgency, there, it's important that we live our lives with a sense of urgency because we do not know if tomorrow is promised to us. As a matter of fact, it's not promised. We don't know if we've got it or not. We've got 2018 right now. We don't know if we've got 2019, right? And so a sense of urgency about what you're doing today regarding how what you're doing today is impacting eternity. That's the sense of urgency that we've got to have. And that's going to be a, that's going to be a common theme throughout the life of Integrity Church this year. What are we doing now in order to build the kingdom of eternity and to, 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 to receive the rewards that God has planned for us as a part of fulfilling the purpose that he has for you and I, because those purposes are different. So that first thing is that sense of urgency. The second thing is the expectation about uh, the perspective of eternity. And then the third thing is the issue of priority. How are we making our decisions? What do your decisions in life tell about your priorities? And what are the priorities? What are the things that are important to you? How are you living your life? Are you living your life for the benefit of others to, be, to fulfill the kingdom of God, uh, to be like Jesus? Or are you kind of just kind of doing your own thing, kind of, you know, plotting out your own agenda and kind of following that, right? So these three things are going to be really important as we move through uh, this year, 2018. And uh, so I, I want us to kind of understand what I'm going to call the big ask today, right? Uh, make, you know, big, the big ask today is simply this. I'm going to read it to you because what I'm going to challenge you with at the end, I'm letting you know up front so it's not a surprise, all right? So the big ask today is this, that you will elevate the standards of all of your communication, your means of communication to the levels and the standards of Jesus' communication. Does that make sense? The challenge today is that you will elevate all your communication, all types of communication. You'll elevate all of it to the standards of the excellence that Jesus expects from you and I in obedience, right? Now, why did you just say, but all means of communication? Weren't we just talking about the tongue? Well, actually, when James talks about the tongue, he is really talking about all means of communication. Because in James' day, guess what? In James' day, pretty much, that was pretty much it, right? Yeah, we could write letters on papyrus and that kind of thing. But for the most part, by far and away, the major way for people to communicate was by the tongue. Now, the tongue means the physical act of speaking. Today, guess what? We have so many more ways to communicate. Would you agree? Now, so one of the principles of Bible study and application is the idea of a word called her hermeneutics, all right? Hermeneutics is the idea of how, basically, just kind of put it real simple. It's, it's really not a, it sounds like a big word. It's not a big deal. It's not a, it's not a you know, it's not a, 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 a confusing concept. It's the idea of being able to take the context that the Bible was written in and which, which existed in the time of the biblical writers and their lifetimes and what was going on then and 
connecting it to today. That's a big part of the idea of human hermeneutics. And that's where we get application. So the intent that James had in talking about the tongue way back yonder in you know, 40, 50 BC, or excuse me, AD, or whatever the case might be, if we apply that and bring that forward to today, the tongue encompasses a whole lot more, right? So our study today, even though we're going to see the term the tongue, is really about everything you do to communicate. And we're going to talk about what those, what those things are. But some of you are communicating something right now, and you're not even saying a word. You realize that? Some of you are communicating something right now, and you're not even communicating a word. That's powerful, all right? So that is why James devoted this, 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 this section, this first section of chapter 3, uh, when he's got this got a little chip on his shoulder right now, because I think something's happened in the church. And so he's kind of letting the church know, hey, you guys have got to do better at this. And so we kind of start out with some words from Jesus. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, he said this, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. So here's the punchline. He says, what you say flows from what is in your heart. Okay? So if you want to get a good indication about what is in someone's heart, listen to what they're communicating. Okay, now having said that, how many of you would say, you know what, I'm very pleased and proud about all the communication I had this week? Yeah, I don't think any of us could say that. Because in reality, probably if you're like me, some of your communication probably gave an indication that maybe there's some stuff in the heart that needs to be worked on, right? Right? And so that's James' point. And so as he kind of goes into the text, he, he, he kind of brings in some things about communication, about the tongue, right? Again, when I'm saying tongue, I'm, I'm redefining the word tongue. I'm not talking about this right here, right? I'm talking about, my fingers taste kind of, some of y'all had something on your hand that I shook today that was kind of gross, <laughs> and I just put it on my tongue. So if I shook your hand, you might need to go wash your hands, not because my hands are dirty, because your hands are dirty. But anyway, whoo! Y'all wash. Yeah, we got that thing out there on a stand. Please use it, right? So anyway, um, when you come in, do me a favor, would you? So, uh, so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal, right? He, 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 uh, Jesus talked about this. Paul talks about this. James talks about this. Let me tell you what, what Paul said. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, he said to the church at Thessalonica, which was a church that had a reputation for being kind of, you know, kinda, uh, they were kind of with it, right? They, they kind of loved each other. They got along. There was a lot of unity, a lot of harmony, etc. So he says this, he says, encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So he pats the church at Thessalonica on the back and says, look, you're doing well. Keep it up, right? Use your words to encourage. Then we read, uh, what the writer of the Proverbs said back in chapter 16 of the Proverbs. And he says this, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Now, you got that? Healthy for the body. You see that? What you say has an impact not only on what people hear and what they think, but what they feel emotionally and also their physical well-being. People who never hear kind words from people that supposedly care about them, are a lot of times they, there are even physical health, physical health manifestations to that, right? This is a far-reaching issue. This is something that touches all of our lives. And that's why in this series, as we talked about last week, the whole idea of what love is, remember we talked about you know, eros love being the romantic love, phileo love you know, uh, being you know, all about the friend kind of love, and then agape love being the love because because God loved me, right? Because I love, you know, that is the love we're supposed to have, right? And now we kind of transition to another major part of our lives, and that is our communication, right? What is your life communicating? What are your words communicating? Well, uh, so, so let's look at what James says about the reality of the tongue, all right? He says this, he says, we make many, we all make many mistakes, but those who control their tongues can also control themselves in every other way. He says, we can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. 
So if you're a horse person, right, you know what he's talking about, right? You can kind of turn, you can make that horse do what you want. He says, in a tiny rudder, if you're a boatsman, I'm a boatsman. Bill Sanders is a boatsman. We have other boatsmen here. We understand what this means. And a tiny rudder makes a huge ship. We don't have huge ships. But turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. Now, what is he saying? Here's the summation of those two verses. Managing the tongue is the best evidence of, two, of true self-control. Okay? What he's saying is this. He says, the tongue is the part of your body, the part of your being, your identity, that is the most difficult to control. It is. And so if you can control that, if you're doing pretty well with your communication, having control over it, you know, that means, you know what, self-control in every other, every other area of your life should be a whole lot easier, right? And, and, so, and so that's his point. And so as he moves into the rest of the passage, he starts out with letting us know some of the risks of the tongue right? So we, we have risks, right? Now keep in mind, as we're talking about tongue, we're, we're going beyond what we're saying, okay, with our, verbal, with our verbals. Now some of you are thinking, well, what other ways do I communicate? I'll get to that, trust me, right? But every type of communication that you do is subject to the standards that James is laying out in the third chapter of this epistle that he wrote to the church uh, at all. So here's the first thing that he tells us about the tongue. With the tongue, there is a high level of what I call disproportionality. Disproportionality. But uh, what does that word mean? What does that mean? I might have just made it up. I don't know, right? But I'm going to define it for you based on what verse 5 says. He says, so also the tongue is a small thing. You got that? Everybody's kind of think about your tongue for a minute in the context of the rest of your body. Guess what? The tongue some of y'all are going, oh, I can see you right now. You're thinking about it, yeah. Your tongue is a small body part. Agree? It's small. But look at what he says. He says, the impact of the tongue is disproportionate to the size of it. And so he goes on to say, but what enormous damage it can do. It's small. It's little. That little bitty thing Young people can cause you to sash your mama and your daddy, right? Parents can cause us to just kind of go off on them, although they usually deserve it. I know. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Just joking. It can cause husband and wife in a moment of frustration to just lash out at each other, which causes then the silent treatment. So we're not talking to each other now for a while. It causes all this stuff this little bitty baby tiny part of our body. And God says, you know what? The evidence of self-control is really in the level to which you can truly control your tongue. So there's a high level of disproportionality. Small, small physical size, major impact. Now, the good news is, and this is where I'm thinking Paul has an edge, right? He's kind of talking to the negative side here, right? And, and so, and, and so the, the good news is that Guess what? Even though the tongue is small, it can also bring a disproportionately level of positive impact. Does that make sense? Right? You got that. Do you, do you understand this? Give me some hope. Go like this if you understand this. Your tongue can also bring lots of great positive stuff, but you have got to be able to live that way because remember what Jesus said in Luke 6. He said what, that what you say is evidenced of what is in your heart. So your heart... Your heart is going to drive what you say. As much as you want to try to be a nice person, but your heart is screwed up, you are not going to say nice things. Because inevitably, you are going to be who you really are. That's why change to become more like Jesus is an inside-out change and not an outside-in change. Does that make sense? It starts with the heart. Where is your heart? Jesus died so that you could have eternal life. Yes, but he died because that was the price for your heart. He wants your heart because that's where you begin to come, become more and more like him. And so there's this high level of disproportionality, both negatively and positively. And so then we see that, that the second thing that we understand about the risk of the tongue is that there's rapid impact. You know, get, can I tell you this? It takes no time for your communication to land. 
and to have an impact. You got it? You know what I'm saying? It takes no time for whatever you say. Some of you, you know how to push the buttons of other people around you. Okay? And those buttons are rapid impact buttons. I love the giggles. There we go. They're kind of looking at each other. Yeah, yeah. That's when you, when you did that yesterday. That's what you were doing. You were pushing my buttons. Yes. Yes, that's what they were doing. Because they know the moment they press it, the impact comes. There is rapid impact with your communication. You want to get back at somebody, you know what to say. If you know them well, you know exactly what to say. You know exactly where to strike, right? And so he says this, and the tongue is a flame of fire. (laughs) It is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. I'm telling you, James is not having a good day. (laughs) Whatever's happened, he is on top of it, but he is ticked. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, for it is set on fire by hell itself. How many of you are at least somewhat captured and you're being held captive by something somebody said to you at some point in time in your past? Now, don't raise your hand. (laughs) You can raise your hand. (laughs) It's okay if you want to. My guess is a lot of us are being held captive by something that someone said to us that probably should not have been said. No, that I can tell you probably, yeah, it probably should not have been said, right? Or maybe should have been said in a different way, okay? That is the rapid fire impact of the tongue. And I can tell you, the biggest impact of the tongue comes from the people that we are closest to. The closest you are to the, indi- the, closer you are to the individual, the bigger the impact, positive and negative. But the problem is that we tend to become more comfortable being ourselves to the people that we're close to. And so it's kind of like the statistic one time that I heard, most accidents happen close to home. I'm like, okay, that's pretty obvious to me because most people kind of stay close to home, right, for the most part, right? The same kind of thing. Most hurts happen close to home. And so it's oftentimes what has the biggest impact are the words and the communications of the folks who are supposed to love us the most. They hurt the most, but the good news is they also help the most. And so this whole idea of disproportionality and rapid impact is important. So what you say, you're just, just an example, right? For rapid impact, what about first impressions? How important is the first thing that you say to an individual when you meet them? How important is that? Oh my gosh, it is so important. So important. Your first impression, a lot of people say, well, I don't really talk to new people, so I don't have to make a first impression. Oh, yes, you do. Because when you don't say it, you're still communicating. Integrity friends, did you hear me? Family members, when you see a new person in this church and you say, I don't really know them, so I'm not going to communicate to them, you just did. Did you hear what I said? You just did. You avoided them. Now, we don't do that a lot. But when we do, it has an impact. I kind of think that might be the type of thing that James might be talking about here a little bit, right? You're surprised, aren't you, right? Because that is how, that is how widely um, distributed that our communication is. Even when we don't think we're communicating, we're communicating something. Well, here's the third thing about the tongue that James tells us. There's a high level of volatility. A high level of volatility, right? This means that our tongue is unstable, okay? That what we do with it can change very rapidly with circumstances, all right? Some of you are thinking, gosh, I wish I hadn't come today, (laughs) I told you last week we're talking about the tongue, right? But I thank you for being here, for being courageous, right? Because you knew. I even put it in the promo for today, right? That's great that you're here. Because you're going to do better with this because you're here today. I can guarantee it. And so what is this whole idea about volatility? People can tame all kind of animals and birds and reptiles and fish. Who's ever taught a dog to sit successfully? (laughs) Many of you have, right? You can teach a dog to sit, but James says no one can tame the tongue. 
He says, it is an uncontrollable evil full of deadly poison. Again, he has really got a chip on his shoulder today. But the, the good side is, it can be incredibly wholesome and beneficial as well. So I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, take our eyes off of that, right? So now a lot of this stuff we said kind of comes from the heart, right? How our heart is that drives what we communicate so often. There's a survey done by AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, and they found that nearly 80% of drivers have expressed significant anger on the roadways. So in that, uh, they have, uh, you know, admitted to things like aggression, road rage behind the wheel at least once in the past year. The most alarming finding suggests that approximately 8 million U.S. drivers engaged in extreme examples of road rage, including purposefully ramming another vehicle or getting out of the car to confront another driver. Many other drivers reported engaging in the following types of road rage. Number one, purposely tailgating closely, 51%. Yelling at another driver, 47%. Honking to show annoyance or anger, 45%. Go ahead, laugh. It's okay. Everybody here is guilty, right? Making angry gestures, 33%. Something that happens to you on the roadway does not entitle you to use a particular digit of your hand that should never be used. Yes, it does. No, it does not. Here's another one. Tried to block another vehicle from changing lanes, 24%. One of the study's researchers concluded that that inconsiderate driving, bad traffic, and the daily stresses of life can transform minor frustrations into dangerous road rage. And normally mild-mannered people into animals, (laughs) basically. (laughs) is kind of what it comes down to, right? So what you communicate, the totality of your being communicates all the time. So there's some high-risk uses of the tongue. Let's talk about that real quick. So we've talked about the fact that the tongue, uh, there's a rapid impact, it's highly volatile, you know, all that stuff. Now, what are the ways that we kind of specifically, you know, kind of do this, the, the, this, this communication thing and, and areas of high risk? First of all, it's complaining, okay? Just complaining. You, ever, you just people just negative all the time, right? Are you that person who's a negative all the time, Right? You know, you're always complaining about something. You're only happy when you're complaining. You know that? When whatever you're complaining about is taken away, what do you find? The new thing to complain about. And and, and it's just kind of the way that it is. You know, we had this one time in a place I worked before, not Integrity Church, thank God, right? Where someone who worked in the office always complained about something. So then we would go and we'd do something about it, take it away. Guess what? The very next week, something new to complain about. Take that away, right? Take that away. Boom, something else, something else. We, had, we fired her. We fired her because you know what? We can't handle that, right? That constant negativity. And, 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 so, and, and so, you know, complaining, griping all the time. Sometimes we complain and we rationalize it that we're venting. I go to my friend Bob, okay, to therapeutically vent, Bob, right? I don't complain when I do that, right? No, of course not. He would not, yeah, but in reality, he'd tell me if I did, right? But we do that, right, a lot of times to mask the fact that we're complaining. And, and, so, and, and so, you know, be careful about complaining because it brings negativity. Your whole being communicates. Here's another one, gossip. Okay, what's Gossip. All right, here, how many, how many of you have ever gotten in trouble by gossip before? Nobody? <laughs> Finally, some teenagers were like, is it okay for me to admit this? Am I going to hell because of this? No. That, no. <laughs> see David, see David, please, about this, would you? You're totally fine. I love your honesty. I love your honesty, folks. I really did. Gossiping is the spreading of things that are not truthful, but also the things that are truthful needlessly. You see a lot of gossip. It's not about stuff that's not true, but it's stuff about is true that really is nobody else's business. 
You see, if something happened to somebody, we really want other people to know about it, right? Because this is what we do. We talk about other people, right, in order to elevate ourselves. It's less about putting them down as it is elevating ourselves. We think we need to get up on a step stool a little bit, right? So I'm going to go to my friend, I'm going to tell some people about my friend Amanda and say some not, not so nice things about her, right? Right? So my goal is not to put down Amanda. In the end, that's what it looks like. But it's really to do what? It's to kind of get me up a, a little higher here, okay? Am I okay to do this, Bill? I hope not. Anyway. That's, that's my point. That's what we do when we do this stuff, right? So gossip can be stuff that's not true or stuff that is true, right? But nobody really needs to know this stuff. You know, how do you know if you're gossiping? Okay, here's the question. You're talking about it, but are you part of the problem? Or are you part of the solution? If you're neither of those, you don't need to be talking about it. You don't need to be talking about it. Stay out of it. You want to go to that person and say, how can I help you? Then do it. But get off it, because a lot of times, you know what you're doing? That person has you wrapped around their little finger, but you don't look at it that way, do we? No, it's kind of like, oh, they deserve it. They deserve it. When in reality, we're the ones held captive. We're the ones held captive. We can't live our lives the way God wants us to live, because we got this grudge thing going on. And like I told a bunch of physicians this past couple of days, we are not equipped to handle emotional grudges. We were never built that way. And so that's something that we need to understand. Now, here's now, that we, we got gossip. We got slander. Slander is the stuff that we just make false accusations. We just tell lies about people, right? And, and maybe lies have been told about you at some point in time in your life. My guess is the odds are yes. Lies have been told about you at some point in life, okay? But God's plan for you is to be resilient and move forward with the truth, because just what people tell you, making up about you does not make them true. God says, I will take care of those things. You don't have to. Romans chapter 14, all right? So uh, another thing, profanity, okay? I apologize in advance for being so blunt with this, but I really don't see any reason for you ever to do something profane or to say something profane. I don't care what your excuse is. It doesn't matter to me. There is no rationale or justification for saying something like that. There's just no need. This kind of goes back to the whole self-control kind of thing, right? If you kind of use the profanity every once in a while, let that be the first thing that you try to kind of gain self-control over. Start there, okay? Start there because, you know, I guarantee you it will help your mind. It will clear it. It will help you think better about good things, Okay? So anyway, those things are, are, kind of, are kind of important. Now, let's see. What are the applications of the tongue, right? Now, as we're talking about the tongue being expansive and incorporating every kind of way that we communicate, what does that really mean? Well, it means my speaking, obviously, right? That's big, and that's still probably the most prominent way to do that because surveys continue to show that the most rich and the most fulfilling way to communicate is still verbally in a conversation, face-to-face, -face, Okay. I don't care. I, I know you like your, your phones. I know oh, this is such a meaningful conversation. Well, it may be, but it's not nearly as meaningful as if it were held face to face, all right, in each other's presence, right? Remember, parents, Steve Jobs never let his kids have iPhones. <laughs> Just something I thought you might want to know. But anyway, here's some applications of the tongue, all right, that we think about today texting. Okay, what are some ground rules for texting? All right, it's important probably in texting that we only communicate factual or logistical or informational type of stuff. Never text emotion. But bud, that's the only way I can communicate with this person. Have you ever heard it face to face? What happened in James Day? They did not text it. Don't tell me that we have gone backwards over that time. Do not text emotion. Do not Facebook emotion. You know what I'm talking about, right? We, that Facebook is our way to take something specific or somebody specific and generalize them in order so that everybody can specifically point the finger back at them. Well, you know what? I found that just people who drive 2012 Civics and who live in Northern Alamance County they like to just say things to make them think that they're better than everybody else. 
So what do we do when we read that? Okay, who do I know that drives a 2012 Civic and lives in Northern Alamance County? That's obviously who they're talking about, right? Have you seen that stuff? You know what I'm talking about, right? We don't do that, right? And, and, so, and so, you know, how about email? Don't do a reply all unless the sender requests it, okay? Nobody's going to read it anyway, right? Nobody's going to read it. Here's another one. Don't do blind copies on your emails. Well, you know what? I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to copy Matt on this because I didn't like what he did, but I'm going to blind copy Matt's boss. Duh. What kind of trust builder is that between Matt and I? Right? You see my point? Yeah. So, so don't do that type of thing. Letters. Does anybody write letters anymore? But anyway, there's a really good positive use of letters. If you don't, you know, we don't need letters much because email can do a lot of the same things that letters, a lot of the same things. But one of the things I really found with letters, if there are people that that you can't make reconciliation with or conflict or whatever the case might be, writing a letter to them and not sending it can be very therapeutic. It can be very good, right? Someone in your life who's had an impact, it's not so great. You need to forgive them. But, you know, you got to kind of get to the point where you do that. You got to work your way toward that. That's okay. The use of a letter that's not sent can often be a very therapeutic thing and something that's very, that can be very helpful. So, so what are some of the things that we would say uh, that, that we need to do? So, so James wants us to understand some things about the tongue. Um, that, that there's some rewards from the tongue, right? There's some ways that we use the tongue that we kind of need to live into. Now, again, talk about the tongue, not just what I'm speaking, what I'm texting, what I'm Facebooking, what I'm you know, emailing, whatever, all of it. Hey, here's the other thing, really, that we didn't talk about here. Uh, you, know what, you know what speaks volumes, probably more so than, than, than your verbals, is your body language. It's your body language. Your body language speaks more than your speech. It does. It, it, it tells more than your speech. Your body language can just immediately wipe out anything that you say if your body language goes contrary to what you just said, okay? Now, let me say, I know that this may be something that we don't think about much, okay? Because we just kind of assume that the things that where, there, where there's verbal or there's written stuff, we assume that that's what our communication is. But it goes so far beyond that. One of the things I'm, on, I'm always on a soapbox about is, is that we don't do that well with self-awareness. And so, therefore, we don't understand what our body language is doing. I can't tell you what my body language is doing right now. I mean, I think I can. You know, I, I don't know. But, you know, I, I, but we don't really think about that. And the best way to get self-awareness is by what? Asking other people, right? You can't figure out. You cannot get self-awareness on your own. How does my body language come across, Doug? Maybe that's what I, I, I need to ask my friend Doug for that, right? How, how does, you know, when I, when I, when I you know, I, I got to ask people, right? So, so maybe between services or whatever, I might sometimes I'll ask my friend uh, Bob or Ray or Doug or Jamie Clapp or somebody, I'll say, you know, what, what would you do differently on that message, you know? Part of me says, man, I really don't want them to answer <laughs> because, you know, they might tell me something that I really need to change. But I know... I've come to know that, you know what, I've got to have that information because I trust them to let me know what they think. It's important, right? Who are the people that you can ask about self-awareness? Don't avoid self-awareness. To avoid self-awareness is a good indication that you're going to screw some of this stuff up that we're talking about today, okay? So what are the three things that James leaves us with? As we close today, let's kind of touch on these real quickly. He says in verses 9 and 10, sometimes the tongue praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it breaks out into curses against those who have been made in the image of God. Whoa, whoa, did you catch that? Made in the image of God. What is he saying? When you break out into curses with your communication, you're really kind of doing it against God. You got that? So when I break out in something, some tirade against my friend Vera, right? who is made in the what? She is made in the image of God. More than most people I know, by the way. But anyway, um, uh, I am what I am railing against God, right? When I do that, that's what James is saying. He says it was not just the individual, right? It's against God. And so he says, uh, and he says, so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. 
And so what Paul, or excuse me, what James brings us back to is the reality that you don't have to do the cursed thing. You can do the blessed thing. And so how do we do the blessed thing? Well, I want to take you to about three places in the New Testament, I think, that kind of gives us some tips on how to do this. Because really, James, James was really having a bad day that day, and he really didn't get to a lot of the solutions, to be honest with you. He was just really thorough on, on getting to the crux of the problem, okay? He wants to get it there. Hey, there's a problem here. So we're going to go to some other places in the New Testament to kind of say some things we should do. And I'm going to give you three T's that I've told you before, okay? And, and, and this is just kind of a way to alliterate them and to kind of put some verses to, to, to substantiate the importance of them. The first is this. We need to demonstrate tone that shows appreciation. When we're talking to other people, our tone needs to be appreciative, okay? Our tone needs to be appreciative, right? So, um, you know, that, 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 it needs to be encouraging, right? This, the verse here says this in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, no matter what happens, always be thankful for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, if we were always thankful about everything, would that change the way we communicate? Would it? Yeah, if we go to it with an attitude of gratitude, sure. You know, God gives me this. God gives me this relationship. Yes, you know, uh, myself and Keith, we had this difference of opinion, yes. But, you know, God gave me this relationship with this man who's a very good friend of mine, okay? And so, so, so that kind of puts the context in a little bit better where Keith and I are going to be able to probably handle things, right, in, in a much more godly fashion, right? And, 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 so, and, and so always be thankful for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus, so we want to show tone that shows appreciation. Be appreciative. Here's the second thing. Topics, the, to the content of the conversation, focus on bringing out that which makes other people better. Okay? What makes other people better? Right? So, you know, we have, uh, you know, I, I say something one day up here, and, and you know, and, 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 I, and I, I, I will do this every once in a while. I will offend you. <laughs> okay? And, and I'll do it. Not with any, I'll just do it because I screwed up, right? So I said, you know, one day I said something, to, I said something about cats one day, okay? Right, and you know, I don't mind cats, I just don't have one, right? And, and somebody told me, I said, look, you know, I, that, the way you said that, it wasn't that I said it, it was the way I said it, right? But you know what? They came to me with content that made sense. This wasn't, oh, you hurt my feelings, da, 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 you know? I, I, no, I didn't, it wasn't that. It was what I said, they legitimately helped me understand why I said what I said I shouldn't say. It. I, it, it didn't take me long. I said, you're right. I should not have said, I am sorry. I am sorry. I should not have done that. Now, they came to me with content that was valuable, okay? So make sure that the topic of the conversation is relevant and valuable and can help make the person better, right? This is a huge point of conflict resolution, Right? Never settle for just saying, okay, it's done, that's it. Try to do it in such a way that each other, we get better, okay? And finally, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, Hebrews chapter 3. Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness, okay? Encourage, encourage, encourage. Make people better. Finally, timing. Timing is important. Tone, topic, timing, okay? You got that? Tone, topic, timing. You got to work together, right? Some of y'all can get two of these real well. The third one is a challenge for you, okay? Some of you get one of them right, and the other two are challenged. Some of the times you don't get any of them right, right? Depending on who you are. But we can all move forward. We can all move forward in this. Third thing is timing that maximizes positive impact. Galatians 6.10. Therefore, wherever we have opportunity or whenever we have opportunity, right, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith, Okay? So here's the idea. I want to make sure that the timing is right for the conversation, okay? So, so tone, topic, timing, all very, very important. I love the way that James finishes up his rant, <laughs> okay? He kind of comes out of the rant a little bit, right, about the tongue, about the way we communicate. And in verses 11 and 12, he kind of goes back to this idea of, you know, really what we communicate on the outside is really indicative of who we are on the inside. And so he says, does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives 
or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. And so then he links up the tongue. I love what he does here. He links up the tongue, and I would encourage you to go and read because I didn't put it on, your, on, your, on the screen. It's my bad, and I didn't put it on your outline. I should have, but, but I didn't. It's so verses 11 through 13. He says, if you are wise and you understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life. Now, one of the ways you prove living an honorable life is the level of control that we can exert over our tongue and our, our communication, okay? That is a huge component of whether or not we're living an honorable life. Doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom, okay? Wisdom, humility, they kind of come together, right? The more humble we are, the wiser we get. The more wiser we get, the more humble we become. And there's this cyclical relationship. The wiser we get, the better use we're going to use of our communication, right? Our relationships will be more productive. They'll be happier. They'll be more fulfilling. There will be less drama in our lives, right? Can I tell you right now that drama is killing you? Drama is killing you. If you're, if, you're, if you're creating or tolerating the drama and not doing something, it's killing you. Because when I say it's killing you, but that's pretty harsh. No. Uh-uh. So a while ago, remember James said this? He said this has impact on the emotions and the body. There are emotional and physical manifestations that are going on with you when you are attracted to drama, okay? So forsake it. Get away from it. God wants us to live a peaceful life. Peaceful. Peace and drama don't really coexist real well, all right? So understand the reality of the tongue, the totality of our communication, what it means, how it works, and sometimes maybe how it doesn't work so that we can try to find a way to make things work better for us. So the big ask today, as I said earlier, is to make sure that we bring the totality of all of our communications up to the standards of Jesus and what he expects from us. When we do that, our lives will be more peaceful. There will be more wisdom. There will be more humility. There will be less drama. And our lives will point others toward Jesus, which is the most important of all.